streaming on ABC News Live. Theater tragedy, new footage shows the inside of a Mariupol building used as a shelter moments after a Russian airstrike. Video shows crowds moving slowly down the main staircase, dust and rubble all around them. Ukraine says 1,000 people were inside the theater when it was struck. 300 men, women and children were killed. Redefining their war plan, a Russian military general says the main goal of the invasion is the liberation of eastern Ukraine. The push to take over Kyiv appearing to end. President Biden preparing to make an address while in Poland tomorrow. First, meeting members of the 82nd Airborne deployed to Europe. Now the U.S. is preparing for a possible Russian attack on allies. Theme park horror. A 14-year-old boy killed, slipping out of his seat on a ride that drops at 75 miles per hour, the teen plunging more than 400 feet. New details on the investigation into how something so horrible could happen on a family vacation. They say their time is now. I've had a lot of people say, why don't you wait your turn? And I look at them and say respectfully, wait my turn for who? The sun is rising on a new era of politics and Gen Z is at the forefront. ABC News Live talking to young hopeful candidates about what they're fighting for and why. I was talking actually with a lady, I think it was a few weeks ago, who said, how old do you have to be to run for Congress? And I said, it says 25 years old in the Constitution. And then she said, well, it sounds like you're just on time. Um, so I would tell those folks we're just on time. Roll out the red carpet. The biggest night in Hollywood is almost here. We take you to Tinseltown for a look at the nominees to know, the award show firsts, and the favorites to win. I feel so honored to be here and to be recognized as a nominee because this is making history. And good evening, everyone. I'm Phil Lipoff, and tonight for Lindsay Davis, thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with Russia possibly on the retreat. One month into this war, an about face today by Russian military leaders saying the main goal of the invasion in Ukraine is to liberate the eastern Donbass region and not seize other parts of Ukraine. This comes as a senior U.S. defense official says Russian forces have suffered multiple setbacks. They have stopped their offensive around Kyiv. That official also says Russian forces have lost full control of the city of Kherson in the south. And this comes as roughly 20 to 60 percent of Russia's missiles have failed in one way or another. And they did hit a fuel depot near Kyiv today. This is a video from that. And this all coming as President Biden arrived in Poland today and met with the president there and U.S. military personnel. Tomorrow, President Biden will meet with a small portion of the roughly 3.7 million Ukrainian refugees who have left their home. One resident who stayed behind today saying, quote, we don't want to leave. This is our land. And that is a common refrain. James Longman leads us off tonight from Lviv. Tonight, Russia now signaling a major change in Ukraine after facing significant setbacks, now appearing to be reframing its mission. The Russian Defense Ministry seeming to significantly scale back its objectives, saying the main goal of the invasion now is to take control of the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. The Pentagon tonight saying Ukrainians have put Russian forces on the defensive around the capital. And for the first time, the U.S. says the Russians no longer have full control of Kherson, a city they had taken over. The Ukrainians now launching counterattacks nearby. A senior U.S. defense official saying Russia may have lost up to 15 percent of its combat firepower and is now bringing reinforcements in from a Russian-occupied region of Georgia. U.S. intelligence believes as many as 10,000 Russian troops may have been killed so far. But while Russia says it's refocusing its occupation on the Donbass region, this Mariupol official challenging what the Russians are now saying. He says he doesn't believe them. It's a lie. They want much more. They want more than Donbass. They want more than Ukraine. It's absolute lie what they say. His city now may be the site of the biggest single loss of life in this war so far. For the first time in videos circulating online, we're seeing the harrowing aftermath of Russia's strike on the theater in Mariupol, where as many as 1,500 people were seeking shelter. Satellite images showing the word children written in Russian, clearly seen in the front and back of the building, the message ignored. 
Just outside the capital, we're seeing the scope of destruction in Erpin. This verified drone video published by local media showing street after street in flames after relentless shelling. And graphic video circulating online of the Russian airstrike in Kharkiv, where people were lined up for humanitarian aid and food. It killed at least six. In southern Ukraine, residents on the front line of the Russian occupation say there have been more rocket attacks in recent days. While some have vowed to stay, others, like 70-year-old Victor, have had no choice but to flee Russia's onslaught. We barely escaped, he says. And James Longman joins us now from Lviv. James, what does this move by Russia signal about the overall fight? Did they get ahead of themselves in trying to invade so much of the country at the same time? Well, Phil, I don't think Russia sees it that way. I mean, their argument is, as has always been, that they believe they wanted to cut off Kyiv, uh, basically encircle it, and then focus on eastern Ukraine. They've always called this a special military operation. I think they also probably thought that they'd be welcomed in a lot of parts of this country. They thought perhaps, especially in cities in the east, places like Kherson, Kharkiv, we've seen them battering Kharkiv with aerial bombardments, thinking they could go in, uh, their ground forces would go in, because perhaps many Russian speakers would welcome welcome them in with flags, uh, with Russian flags, you know, welcoming Russian troops as liberators. So I think there was possibly a miscalculation uh, on the Russian part. Uh, but that's certainly not how Russia is framing it. They're saying that this was always the plan uh, all along. I think one of the things that we're hearing a lot of is uh, Russian troops uh, going quite far into Ukraine and not occupying enough territory. We always, if you remember before this invasion happened, a lot of military analysts were saying, well, Russia doesn't have enough troops to occupy the whole country. Uh, and we've seen now that when troops were going in, they weren't occupying villages because they thought villagers would come out to welcome them. That meant that they were exposed and they've just then been attacked by a lot of regular Ukrainians who have armed themselves and, of course, have been armed by uh, Western countries and have pushed them out. So, yes, it does look like a miscalculation on Russia's part. That, though, However, is not how Russia is framing it. They need something to be able to sell back home, back in Russia, to say, look, we got something, we got a win, and this is how they're framing it. Phil? Right. James Longman, thanks so much. Before arriving in Warsaw, President Biden visited with U.S. service members at a military base in Poland, just 60 miles from the Ukrainian border. He will meet with refugees tomorrow at the border. ABC's chief White House co correspondent Cecilia Vega is traveling with the president tonight. Tonight, as NATO allies prepare to move more troops and weapons into Eastern Europe, President Biden in Poland with members of the 82nd Airborne, more than 10,000 U.S. troops in Poland right now, the president thanking them for their service. What's at stake, not just in what we're doing here in Ukraine to try to help the Ukrainian people and keep the massacre from continuing, but beyond that, what's at stake is what's, what, what's, what are your kids and grandkids going to look like in terms of their their, their freedom. President Biden standing firm in his promise not to send troops into this war and standing alongside Poland's leader, he said the true show of strength is the unity of the NATO alliance against Vladimir Putin. The single most important thing that uh, we can do from the outset is keep the democracies united in our opposition and our effort to curtail the devastation that is occurring at the hands of a man who, I quite frankly, think is a war criminal. Strong words from the president. Cecilia Vega joins us now from Warsaw. Cecilia, the president is set to visit with refugees tomorrow, but the White House tonight making it very clear he will be staying on the Polish side of the border. Yeah, that's right, Phil. In fact, the president said today very publicly that, in fact, he wanted to cross over the border like he has in other conflicts to witness the, the humanitarian side of this crisis firsthand. But the security invo concerns involving a White House crossing, uh, a president rather, crossing into a war zone is just obviously too much. Uh, on meeting with these refugees, the president told me yesterday this is something that he really wanted to do while he's on this trip. And the majority, in fact, of those Ukrainian refugees who have fled their country because of this war are now here in Poland. And so the president coming face to face with the crisis, the humanitarian side of this crisis tomorrow, Phil. Yeah, Cecilia, it is so impactful to see that side of the crisis. Thank you so much. Joining us now for more on the situation in Ukraine is co-chair of the Ukrainian caucus in Congress, Republican Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick of Pennsylvania. Congressman, th thanks so much for taking the time with us tonight. My pleasure. 
So you recently visited the Ukrainian border as part of a bipartisan delegation. I was actually over there covering this when you were there. We are now one month into this war that many thought would be over in just a matter of days. Today, Russian military appeared to change posture, saying the goal is now to take Donbass, not all of Ukraine. In light of these developments, in your view, is Ukraine getting the upper hand on this conflict? Well, um, Vladimir Putin significantly underestimated the, the will of the Ukrainian people. It's something that I'm uh, firsthand witness to. I live there, actually. Uh, I, my last FBI assignment as an FBI agent uh, was in Ukraine um, right before I, I left the FBI to run for Congress. And um, anybody who's familiar with the people uh, know they have uh, hearts of gold. They have incredible uh, amount of passion. Uh, as far as what I saw on the border, uh, heartbreaking images, which I'm sure you saw, particularly on uh, the Ukrainian side uh, of Lviv province, where uh, these Ukrainian men, as you all know, age uh, 18 to 60, cannot leave the country. Just the, the images of them dropping off their elderly parents, their spouses, their children, uh, perhaps saying goodbye to them for the last time was just heartbreaking. And on the other side in Poland, where I was seeing the women and children come over, was equally as heartbreaking. It was really hard uh, to, to, to see the future for these people. They couldn't see the future. Um, you've called for a no-fly zone in Ukraine, which, of course, is what President Zelensky has continuously asked the world to enact for weeks now. If the Ukrainians are, I don't know about turning the tide, but maybe at least fighting off hard enough, is now the right time to risk a no-fly zone, given the implications, if the U.S. or NATO were to shoot down a Russian plane? Well, uh, there are hundreds of thousands of people in Mariupol uh, who are uh, stranded, uh, going on day 10 without food, water, or electricity. Uh, this could turn into what is already an awful situation into an epic disaster. Now, when I say that, um, what I'm talking about is essentially providing them with the defensive equipment that they've been asking for in the air to provide their own no-fly zone. Uh, these are things that could prevent, or I'm sorry, protect a humanitarian corridor uh, for these um, innocent civilians to make their way out. But Ukraine has not yet received them. So that would be the first step as far as supporting a Ukrainian no-fly zone, give the Ukrainian military the air equipment they need to enforce, create and enforce their no-fly zone. You, along with many of your colleagues and people all across the world, have called President Putin a murderous war criminal. I assume you think it's difficult to deal rationally with someone like that. I think that's the problem with this whole a situation. So then what's the end game? What, what, what do we do if Putin is as you describe it? Yeah. So I said on the House uh, uh, Intelligence Committee, we've been getting evidence for quite some time now <clears throat> of Putin's deteriorating mental state. Um, so it is what it is, really. I mean, we what we need to do is do what's right. Um, I don't think that we should be allowing Vladimir Putin to determine what's provocative and what isn't. Um, which is essentially what uh, the posture of many people has been. I think that's a, a big, big mistake. I think we need to have our own red lines and enforce those red lines. Um, you know, as far as what, how to best handle Putin, Putin understands one thing, and that's strength. And Putin can smell uh, weakness like a shark can smell a drop of blood in the ocean. The president says NATO is more united than ever, and the U.S. has helped mobilize an unprecedented effort to sanction Russia, as you know. On the diplomatic front, do you believe President Biden has handled this crisis well? What more do you think he could have done? Well, I think some things have, have worked well and others haven't. So uh, the first thing that the administration deserves credit for is declassifying a lot of the intelligence to get out in front of the messaging uh, ahead of Putin's propaganda so that the whole world uh, was able to call his bluff when he had these false flags, uh, these pretexts that he had set to try to get world support behind his bogus operation <clears throat> and his criminal invasion. What hasn't worked well, the sanctions uh, are too little. Uh, we shouldn't be sanctioning 80 percent of the banks. We should be sanctioning 100 percent of the banks because Putin controls 100 percent of the banks. We shouldn't be sanctioning half of Russia's economy. We should be sanctioning all of it, 50 percent of Putin's GDP is the energy sector. That has largely remained untouched. And then lastly, getting uh, Ukraine the defensive equipment that they've asked for. Uh, the Ukrainians, every single day is important, and every single action that we take or don't take 
is significant. Congressman, quickly before we go, something that I, I was unprepared for when I, when I went over there and spent three weeks with Ukrainian refugees is the resolve. Uh, a lot of these women who crossed the border with their kids wanted to get them safe and then go back to help their husbands and brothers and fathers fight. You live there as an FBI agent. You know the people. Just speak briefly on the heart of the Ukrainian people. Uh, the one silver lining in all of this is that the world is now getting to witness what I got to experience uh, during my time there, the, the incredible courage of these people. Uh, and that's being exhibited by Volodymyr Zelensky, uh, who has shown the world he's a modern-day Churchill. Uh, he is willing to stay and die for his country. And I think it's important to note, uh, the United States of America is only 245 years old. Uh, that's just a few generations. And yet, we are the world's oldest democracy. No democracy on this planet has survived more than a few generations. And it's, it, it could disappear very quickly. And if Ukraine should be teaching the world anything, it's how fragile democracy is. Ukrainian independence is only 30 years old. And if anybody was questioning whether uh, the, the Ukrainians are worthy of NATO membership, many people were criticizing their military, saying they weren't up, weren't up to par. Hopefully their opinion has changed after witnessing what we're seeing now. It's a remarkable thing to see their resolve. Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, thank you so much for taking the time with us tonight. Really do appreciate it. Thank you. We turn now to a tragedy on a family vacation. A 14-year-old boy somehow slipped through the harness and fell off that free fall ride, plunging 400 feet to his death at Orlando's Icon Park. ABC's Will Carr has a look at the investigation into what went wrong on the tallest drop tower in the world. It happened just after 11 p.m. at the Icon Amusement Park in Orlando. The ball caught on camera, the video too graphic to show. Authorities say 14-year-old Tyree Sampson was thrown from the freefall ride just before it ended. The ride was going, and during the middle of the ride, the, the guy just came off. <laughs> after the fall, you can hear a worker asking others if they checked the ride. Tyree was here on spring break with a friend's family. He was just 14, but he was 6'5 and was gearing up to play football for a top high school program this fall. He was a great kid. He was a student of the game. He was very humble, very respectful. The 430-foot tall ride opened recently and claims to be the world's tallest freestanding drop tower. It drops at 75 miles an hour. Our hearts are broken for that family of the young men. It is such a heartbreaking tragedy. Will Carr joins us now. Will, tell us, what kind of restraints does this specific ride have? Phil, the ride has over-the-shoulder restraints that are supposed to be locked in before the ride starts. It's now up to the Department of Agriculture to figure out exactly what went tragically wrong. Phil. Will Carr, thanks so much. And tonight in Washington, the growing reaction after reports of those emails from the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas Virginia Thomas, urging former President Trump's White House chief of staff to pursue efforts to overturn the 2020 election. The email surfacing as that House committee investigates the Capitol riot. Question now, will they ask her to testify? ABC's chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl reports. Justice Clarence Thomas is facing tough questions about the alarming messages his wife Ginny sent to then White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows in the days after the 2020 presidential election. The messages urged extreme measures to overturn the results, calling Biden's victory, quote, the greatest heist of our history. In one message obtained by the January 6th committee, Ginny Thomas wrote, quote, make a plan, release the Kraken, and save us from the left taking America down. The messages are under particular scrutiny because at the time, President Trump was openly talking about taking his case to the Supreme Court. We'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. It's going to end up perhaps at the highest court in the land. Hopefully they will do what's right for our country. When the Supreme Court refused to hear a case challenging election results in Pennsylvania, Clarence Thomas was one of three justices who dissented, calling it, quote, baffling. But perhaps more striking, he was the only justice to support Trump's efforts to block the release of White House documents related to January 6th, documents that could have included messages from his wife. Now several Democrats are crying foul. Senator Ron Wyden saying, at bare minimum, Justice Thomas needs to recuse himself from any case related to the January 6th investigation, and should Donald Trump run again, any case related to the 2024 election. 
John Carl joins us now. John, any indication that Justice Thomas will actually recuse himself from any of these cases? None at all, uh, Phil. Uh, we have reached out to both uh, Justice Thomas and Jenny Thomas. Uh, no comment from either of them. But there is nothing that can require a Supreme Court justice uh, to recuse uh, himself or herself. No requirement whatsoever uh, that that be done. And as for Republicans, they are firmly standing behind Justice Thomas. Uh, in fact, Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, said today that he has, quote, total confidence in Thomas's brilliance and impartiality. John Carl, thanks. Thank you. And next tonight, we are tracking spring weather extremes on both coasts this weekend. Record heat out west and a major winter blast here on the east coast. Wind chills dropping into the single digits in some places. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano tracking it all for us. Hey, Rob. Hi, Phil. Yeah, it's uh, March Madness for sure with several more rounds of Arctic air that are going to parade across uh, really the eastern third of the country. Here it comes. Wind advisors are up for uh, many states across the upper Midwest and those showers you see extrude across the Great Lakes. Those are the troughs that are kind of reinforcing the cold air. So by uh, Sunday morning, we're looking at below freezing wind chills. Pretty much everywhere in northeastern third, New York, uh, New York, Boston, Burlington, Bristol will be 18 below zero wind chills in parts of Michigan. And the cold, the core of that cold air slides into the northeast uh, come Monday morning. So uh, we're not quite into the deep of spring just yet. But uh, yeah, we want the heat. Uh, our friends in the southwest got it uh, tomorrow. I think we'll see some records fall. Las Vegas, Phoenix, this is very warm for this time of year. They'll start to get a little bit cooler Sunday, Monday as another system comes into the southwest. And that one actually will set the stage for more in the way of severe weather come the middle of next week. Phil? All right, Rob, thanks. You bet. And when we come back, the heart-stopping video. Take a look, a trooper trying to help a stranded family and the semi-truck barreling in. Our exclusive conversation with two of the funniest women in Hollywood who also happen to be hosting the Oscars. But up next, with midterm primary season getting closer, we meet Gen Zers who say now is their time to shake up the political world. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The deeper you go into the black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was diva, drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Money. 
America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back and take a look at this video. This Kansas trooper got a lot more than he bargained for Oof, when a semi truck narrowly missed barreling right into him. It all began when he was called to the scene to assist a driver and a child. His car got stranded in the middle of the highway. They couldn't get out. He actually parked his car in front of theirs to avoid a car from plowing into them when the semi almost hit him. He was okay and afterwards was able to get the family out of the car too. The median age in the United States was 38 back in 2019, according to the census. So can you guess what the median age of Congress is? In the House of Representatives, it's 58. In the Senate, it's 64. So some Gen Zers are trying to change that by throwing their hat into the ring and running for office. ABC congressional correspondent Rachel Scott got to catch up with two young people hoping to change the face of politics. Never planned to end. A new era of politics is taking shape. Tell them the truth. Tell them how it is. Well, I have a special guest with me today. From the White House, tapping pop star Olivia Rodrigo on COVID-19 vaccinations. Encouraging all communities to get vaccinated. To briefing TikTok influencers, getting the word out on Russia's war against Ukraine. Russian missiles have forced the residents of the Ukrainian capital to seek shelter in bunkers. And youth climate activists testifying to Congress. My generation doesn't care about the politics around climate change. We want productive discussions, realistic answers, and sound policies. Now looking to make their mark and represent their own generation in the nation's capital. It's critical that we get new energy, new voices, new people involved in our democratic process, uh, particularly in the halls of Congress, which are incredibly and unnecessarily polarized by fights among older generations over cultural issues and other things that reflect their inability to keep up with the changing world. In New Hampshire's first district, Republican candidate Caroline Levitt wants to make history as the youngest member of Congress. She turns 25 just weeks before the primary. Are people surprised when they learn your age? Yes, they are. It's always the number one question I received. Why are you doing this? You're so young. And that's one of the many reasons I am. We need young, fresh leadership in Washington, again, on both sides of the aisle. The former aide to President Donald Trump and Congresswoman Elise Stefanik is running in a crowded GOP primary. Several Republican candidates are hoping to flip the district red. Young voters in this country overwhelmingly vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. So what does your party need to do to change that? We are losing with my generation of voters big time. That's a serious problem for our country. And my generation in particular lacks young conservative voices. We need to encourage young conservatives when they come along. And we also have to do a much better job with messaging. 1,300 miles away from the New Hampshire snows in the Sunshine State's 10th Congressional District, we find 25-year-old Maxwell Frost vying to represent Florida in our nation's capital. Hey, Ron DeSantis! Hey, Ron DeSantis! A former ACLU organizer and March for Our Lives activist, Frost would also become the first congressional member of Generation Z if elected. What was behind the decision to run. For me, it's actually when I was connected with my biological mother. She had me at the most, one of the most vulnerable points in her life. I hung up the phone and I said, I need to run for Congress, not just for myself, but for the issues that young people are being affected by these days. We live in a different world, um, different economy, different technology, and so we need that perspective. Currently, baby boomers make up nearly 60% of Congress. They account for 21% of all Americans. Two thirds of congressional members are over the age of 55. Just 7% of House Democrats are under 40. We get a few more people in there who know what social media can do, who stay in touch directly with their constituents. Congress would better reflect the, vi the wishes and values of its constituents, individual district constituents and overall electorate.
The change young adults would like to see may be difficult to materialize. I believe strongly and unapologetically in the America First agenda that I helped implement in President Trump's White House. No matter who you are, no matter how old you are, rich, poor, right, I'm here to represent everybody. While Levitt and Frost detail the need for a congressional facelift, both candidates sticking to familiar talking points. Levitt says she believes transgender women should not be able to compete alongside other girls, rejects the notion of a climate crisis amid global warming, and falsely believes former President Donald Trump won the 2020 election. Frost hopes to be a champion against gun violence if elected, expand Medicare and eliminate insurance co-pays, deductibles and premiums, and supports Congressional Democrats' Green New Deal to curb the effects of climate disasters. As the 2022 midterm elections inch closer, Levitt and Frost not letting any criticism stand in their way of making history for themselves and their generation. I've had a lot of people say, why don't you wait your turn? And I look at them and say respectfully, wait my turn for who? There has never been a more urgent time to shake up Washington. There has never been a more urgent time to send people there who have fresh eyes, fresh ideas. I was talking actually with a lady, I think it was a few weeks ago, who said, how old do you have to be to run for Congress? And I said, it says 25 years old in the Constitution. And then she said, well, it sounds like you're just on time. Um, so I would tell those folks we're just on time. And still to come here on Prime, the deepening mystery as the search for a woman who was possibly snatched from a Walmart parking lot continues. Back to work for one group of teachers, we'll explain. And we've heard so much about Oscars So White. Will the show be more diverse this year? We're going to take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, the first Latina to ever be number one on the Spotify global charts. Shout out to Anita. black market, the darker it gets. Traffic, Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life like this. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. These days, with so much going on, it's hard to keep up. While others are recapping yesterday's headlines, we're bringing you the right now. This is the busy border crossing. Steel barricades, another strike. The right now look at the day ahead, how it affects you and your family. Record high gas prices. The threat of cyber warfare. Is peace possible? World News Now beginning at 2 a.m. Eastern, followed by America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. Streaming here on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. I risked my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. The Academy Awards air this Sunday on ABC, and UCLA is out with its Hollywood Diversity Report, highlighting the role of people of color in the film industry, which is more ethnically diverse than ever before. Let's take a look by the numbers. For the first time since the report began tracking such stats about a decade ago, the majority of Oscars in 2021 went to films that were directed by people of color and featured minority leads. 
The third highest grossing film of 21, F9, The Fast, to so the Fast Saga, featured a cast that was more than 50% minority. And the report found that eight of the 10 top theatrically released films in 2021 featured casts that were greater than 30% minority. Overall, about 43% of actors in the movies analyzed by the report were minorities. That's more than double the percent from 2011, the first year the data was collected by the authors. And that's been boosted by a more diverse slate of films being released on streaming platforms. Some 72 films with majority minority casts were released on streaming in 2021. Black actors held 18% of overall acting roles in the films analyzed compared to making up about 13% of the U.S. population. But Latino representation has lagged, with Latinos holding just 7.7% of overall acting roles, despite making up nearly 19% of the U.S. population. And behind the scenes, filmmaker and screenwriter minority representation still does lag. But minority audiences are boosting the box office. The report found that for six of the 10 top grossing films that opened in theaters in 2021, people of color made up the majority of opening weekend ticket sales. And we still have a lot to get to here on Prime. Judge Jackson gets a major vote of support in the efforts to get her on the Supreme Court bench. Our Ginger Z takes us to Florida to show us the efforts to protect the manatee. It's this week's It's Not Too Late. And we're going to the red carpet. Kana Whitworth is standing by to tell us a few things we won't want to miss from this year's Academy Awards. First, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. Time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places, but crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. The Kremlin now reframing its objectives in Ukraine. A senior Russian military official today saying the purpose of its military operation in Ukraine is to liberate the eastern Donbass region and not to seize other parts of Ukraine. The utter destruction from the Russian assault in war-torn residential areas. 
a woman, asking why Putin would kill children. But near the capital, Kyiv, the UK Ministry of Defense saying Ukrainian troops have beaten back Russian forces, retaking several towns that have been in Russian control and forcing the invaders to retreat. Judge Kentanji Brown Jackson is on track to be confirmed as the next Supreme Court justice. As Democratic Senator Joe Manchin says, he will vote to confirm her, a day after Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said he would not. Accusing her of being soft on crime, but Republican opposition alone is not enough to stop Judge Jackson's confirmation. As long as Democrats stay united, they have the votes to be able to push this through. So the Senate Judiciary Committee will be meeting on Monday, hoping to vote her nomination out of the committee by by April 4th, sending it over to the full Senate for a vote by Easter, which means in about two weeks, Judge Jackson is now on track to make history as the first black woman confirmed to the Supreme Court. This morning, a potential witness identified in the abduction of 18-year-old Naomi Irion as the nationwide manhunt intensifies for the suspect seen in this surveillance video. This is the literally the worst thing that could ever happen to a family. This video shows him walking directly in front of another car, parked with its headlights on nearby. That vehicle and its occupant now identified. The monster has my baby. We don't know what's happening to her right now. We have to find her. Investigators tracing pings from Naomi's cell phone to find her car abandoned three days later, not far from the Walmart. They say evidence found inside suggests her disappearance was criminal in nature. Authorities now urgently searching for that man with a distinct walk and for this vehicle, a dark colored 2020 or newer Chevrolet four-door pickup truck. After two weeks, a tentative agreement has been reached between unions representing teachers and staff and Minneapolis public schools. I'm just really grateful that we were able to come together at the end of the day and so grateful that we're able to get our kids back in school. Superintendent N. Graf says they hope to welcome students back to school on Monday, but he didn't give out any details as to what's included in the contracts both sides have agreed to. The union says the contracts include important wins for students and schools and that major gains were made when it comes to pay for educational support professionals, protections for educators of color, class size caps, and mental health support. Many families are now wondering what this means for students. Here's what the district had to say. We have a certain number of days that we have to complete for a school year. We also have a certain number of hours, and so those are some of the factors we have to work through. A blind Michigan basketball player is breaking misconceptions after making a free throw. The video, which has now gone viral, shows high school junior Jules Hoogland making the shot during a game. With the sound, it gives me an exact location of where the hoop is. Most people don't understand how I live my life. This is my normal, but they don't understand what it's like to be blind. Oh my goodness, Hoogland says she wasn't able to make a shot in practice, but once she was on the court, she banked in her second attempt. And those 2,000 in the gym aren't the only ones who saw the shot. The video has since gone viral with millions of views across several platforms, even being shared by ESPN, a feat Hoagland didn't expect, but is happy to be breaking misconceptions. That's what I have to do every day is I have to educate people. That was like 10 of those views. Every year, so many people travel to Florida to catch a glimpse of a manatee. But tonight, manatees are facing a dire threat and need our help. As our Ginger Z reports, it's not too late to reverse course and save the critical and beautiful species. Hi, I'm Ginger Z, and it's not too late. Today, this story is all about them the iconic Florida manatee. They are inexplicably adorable and also a critical part of our ecosystem. But right now, they're facing a dire threat. Tell me how many manatee were lost in the last 13, 14 months. Yeah, we had 1,100 just in 2021. We've now had almost 300 just in the first two months in 2022. So just in 2021 alone, we lost the amount equal to 20% of the East Coast population. These two men have dedicated their careers to protecting the manatee. Wayne has been counting manatee for 42 years, so he's gonna take me to see some. Ready, Wayne? Ready. 
Manatees live in marshy coastal areas and rivers, like this one at Blue Spring State Park. There we are. We've got manatee. And they love to eat seagrass. They eat how much? <laughs> they say 10% of their body weight. So if you're 2,000 pounds, you're eating 200 pounds a day. A day? Yes. But on the east, the, the lack of seagrass is really... Is what the problem is over there on the east coast, right. yeah. And it, it sounds like a very tough word, but starvation's it. Mm-hmm, that's it. Seagrass is dying because of water pollution. That's caused by excess nutrients from things like leaky septic tanks, fertilizer, and sewage. The pollution can make these harmful algal super blooms, which cloud the water and then block out sunlight. That makes the seagrass die. After the super blooms kill the seagrass itself by shading it out, then that very ve vegetation from the seagrass itself decays, and those nutrients become available. They feed the next round of harmful algal blooms. That vicious cycle is at a crisis point in places like the Indian River Lagoon in Brevard County. Brevard County is ground zero for the manatee population. We have the largest population here. We have the majority of manatees, so we also have the majority of manatee deaths. Part of the reason why pollution is so bad here is because the lagoon is protected by a barrier island and only has five inlets, roughly 90 miles apart. And so what we put into the water here stays into the water here and, and just builds up over time. To help address the water pollution, Brevard County passed a sales tax. That would help with major infrastructure issues like sewage and septic tanks that are contaminating the groundwater. We currently anticipate that we will collect over $540 million, um, and that will fund you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pounds of, of nutrient reduction. But we also need regulation to address new development. Because right now, when developments go in, there is no law or policy that says you have to do it this way. There is a lot of law and policy, but it is still insufficient. The silver bullets that have worked in other places, we have already done, and they weren't enough. So we need lots of small magic wands with everybody participating. One of those magic wands is a consumer incentive program. They call it Lagoon Loyal. It encourages people to reduce their own water pollution. So they can uh, do simple activities on their own and earn points to go to businesses throughout the county. And so some of the activities include picking up after your pet waste, washing your car in the grass instead of on the cement where it's going to drain into the storm drains and then into the lagoon. When I was a kid, the river was gin clear. There were seagrass beds, you know, as far as you could see, and so many fish. It was so beautiful. Laura Lee Thompson was raised along that lagoon and now makes her livelihood off of it. She has a family seafood restaurant, the Dixie Crossroads. So when we opened the restaurant 38 years ago, we served almost all, everything we served came out of the river. We had mullet and clams and oysters and different kinds of shrimp. And now I can't, I, I don't serve anything that comes out of the river now. The, the product is simply not available. So that incentive program, how does that work at your restaurant? So if they do something that alters their behavior, that benefits the lagoon and they print their coupon, they can come to the restaurant and get a 10% discount on their meal. Water pollution is not just a Florida or a manatee issue, and there are simple ways that all of us can be better. Replace chemical fertilizers with organic products or just don't use them. Mulch or compost yard waste. Don't dump motor oil down the drain. Dispose of it at an auto parts store. You can usually do that for free. Even with current efforts to reduce the water pollution, Experts say it's going to take more than a decade for the manatees to recover. There they are. Oh. There's the babies. That buoy? Oh, right here. OK. The fast moving one is Plantana. OK. And the slower one is Pippin. We made it. There we are. We've got manatee. <laughs> For now, organizations across the state of Florida are working together to rehab more than 80 manatees and get them back to healthy habitats. I mean, he was young when he was brought in, so they want to be able to track him and make sure he adopts, adapts to wildlife. Learns how to get out there in the river and feed and find his way back to the warm water in the winter. Why do we care about manatee? Well, you hate to see anything disappear. Mm -hmm. If you nice. save them, you save all kinds of smaller things mm -hmm. that you don't never even know were in danger. I'm Ginger Z, and it's still not too late for the manatee. 
And that's good to know. Ginger, thank you. It's strange to say this out loud, but for the first time in four years, the Oscars will actually have a host. Can you believe that? Four years. Three of the funniest women in Hollywood will be running the show, and our Lara Spencer sat down with two of them to hear their game plan. I probably will be nervous on the night. It definitely helps knowing I'm going to walk out it, with, yeah. with Regina with yes. and Amy. I mean, it, yes, yeah. yeah. It's, it's different. It's different. With having power in numbers, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Because if we suck, you won't suck alone. Right. With just two days to go, hosts Wanda Sykes and Regina Hall speaking to us about this Sunday's Academy Awards. I mean, I'm looking forward to interacting with the audience. Mm -hmm. I've watched them since I was a little girl, their mm -hmm. movies. It's just so many great moments, uh, musical artists. So I think there's not, you know, I'm gonna I'm lock eyes with the whole crowd if I can. Yeah. What's been the best advice from past Oscar hosts? <laughs> Whoopi told me to just, she said, y'all go out there and have fun. She said, the more fun you all have, the more fun the audience has. Wrap it up, we want to go home. Same thing with Jimmy Kimmel. Mm -hmm. The room is having fun, yes, it it's is. a great show. Yes, he yes. said, so have fun. Sykes and Hall, along with Amy Schumer, who wasn't able to join us, are making history as the first all-female trio to host the Oscars. If they called me and said, yeah. would you host the Oscar? Hell no. Right, that's a different. You would not have done it if it was not. you solo? Absolutely not. I don't think I would have no either. No way in the world. Talk to me about the experience of the three of you acting as a team. Amy is driving us nuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say it right now. Now it can be told. <laughs> yeah, she's driving us nuts. So, ladies, are you ready to host the Oscars? Yeah. We're going to crush this. We just have to do better than last year's host. That is the thing. Yeah. We shot the promos. It was the first time we all got together. Yeah. And Amy comes in, OK, all right, look, this is what we're going to do. It was like, it was like, uh, when a squirrel gets in your house and you're just like, where'd it go? You know, and it's like running up and down your leg. And that was the energy that Amy has. Yeah, she another. is so excited yeah, about she really is. this. Schumer telling us last week why she decided to take the hosting gig. I just feel like we're, you know, we're coming out of this pandemic and I think we all have kind of a new lease on life. And I'm like, I want to host the Oscars. I want to perform. I feel like telling jokes and, you know, getting to do it with Wanda and Regina is like beyond my wildest dreams. And on a night celebrating movies' biggest stars with three of the funniest women in comedy at the helm, anything is possible. I'm really excited about the snippets we've heard about the music. Mm. Mm. A singing? Uh oh, I didn't gave it oh, away. Don't, don't. I didn't gave it away. <laughs> Will Packer, your incredible executive producer, has called himself the coach mm -hmm. of you guys and said, I need to put these three amazing players in the right positions. What positions would you say you all are playing in this year's Super Bowl of Hollywood, the Oscars? Mm. We have a mm. strong offense. I think so. He set it up where we, you know, yeah. we, we come out, we're united, mm -hmm. and then, you know, hand the ball off here, yeah. Amy, you run with it, yeah. and then it's, you know, pass boom, it. pass yeah. it to Regina, yeah. maybe, you know. Throw it back. Throw I don't know back. football, but maybe whenever, it, when they do that. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, hi. <laughs> Three female hosts running yeah. the show, a Will Packer production. Yes. I mean, this is a different year. Yeah. It's exciting. I we'll be able to celebrate after. You know, hopefully we'll be hungover right. from celebrating. I hope so. Smiling already, Lara, thank you. So the Oscars are back, and the biggest names in film are ready to take home the gold. We are obviously counting down to Sunday's show. ABC's Kana Whitworth joins us live from Hollywood to help us out. Kana, I do feel like the first question must be, who are you wearing? But we'll let you off the hook for that. How about that? <laughs> I, I appreciate that, Phil. So listen, this is the 94th telecast. Can you believe that? And in the last 94 years, they have given out nearly 3,300 Oscars. So there's a lot of history to be celebrated. And I am taking you inside the prep. So I want you to look down. You can see this is lined with press from all over the world coming to the Academy Awards. And you can see right now what I'm walking on. I'm making it a little bit hard on my cameraman here. But what we're walking on is actually the red carpet. And sometimes it feels like you're sort of walking on bubble wrap because they have it all protected right now and this is actually where the stars will be walking they'll walk right down here past this this is where fans will get to sit this is how close they will be to their stars as they walk this 900 feet of red carpet but of course Phil you know they're not ignoring the things that are going on in the world right they're not ignoring COVID they're not ignoring the war in Ukraine but ultimately what the producer says is he wants this to be a crowd pleasing night of celebration for everybody 
Hey, Kena, there are some interesting celebrity facts this year, including a potential EGOT and some couples news. Right? So I think the couple thing is one of my favorite parts of this film. So Kirsten Dunst and her husband, um, Jesse Plemons, they're both nominated in The Power of the Dog for their supporting role. So we'll likely see them walk down this red carpet together. Uh, also, of course, um, Javier Bardem and Penelope Cruz also nominated. So they'll be walking down the red carpet together. And I think a lot of people really feel like this Sunday is Lin-Manuel Miranda's time to shine. Finally, he will get his EGOT so he can win. He's won his Emmy. He's won his Grammy. He's won his Tony. Finally, he will get his Oscar. They really feel like the night is for him. But Phil, before yeah. you get to go, obviously what I'm wearing is Nike, just so <laughs> you know, okay? <laughs> You're the smartest one there on the red carpet, Kana, for that. Hey, listen, before you go, yeah. I've been told that the red carpet actually yeah. looks pink while you're there. Is that true? Uh, I, I kind of agree. Let me see if I can take you and so you can kind of look. It's a special combination of colors. And so when you look really closely up, oh, they're wheeling stuff right in front of you. Of course. Good work, guys. I know how hard you're working. Good stuff. But it kind of does have a pink tinge. Would you agree? Absolutely. I've been told by a friend who's covered yeah. it for years that it kind of looks pink, and it does. <laughs> Kana Whitworth, thanks so much. Enjoy yeah. the, the weekend. And ABC News Live has you covered leading up to the Oscars. Stream with us Sunday starting at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, 10.30 a.m. Pacific. Before we go tonight, we have this image of the day. The return home for four airmen who paid the ultimate price during a training exercise in Norway. A dignified transfer ceremony is a somber reminder of the toll of even military vigilance. May Marine Captain Matthew Tomkovich, Captain Ross Reynolds, Gunnery Sergeant James Speedy, and Corporal Jacob Moore all rest in peace. I'm Phil Lipoff. That's our show for this hour. One programming note to share with you. The Ukraine war now entering its second month. Our Lindsay Davis will be live in Poland next week detailing what's next for the millions who have been displaced. Until then, stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in our next hour, we are staying on top of several stories. How do you push forward when the pandemic and gun violence are both ravaging your community? Stick around for our conversation with one ER doctor. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. 
I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks so much for streaming with us tonight. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Both House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Leader Kevin McCarthy have said it is time. Nebraska GOP Representative Jeff Fortenberry resigned. Fortenberry was found guilty yesterday of concealing information and making false statements to federal authorities. The FBI was investigating campaign contributions apparently funneled to him from a Nigerian billionaire. An investigation is underway into a deadly helicopter crash just outside Dallas. Video from the chopper spinning as it falls out of the sky. Two people were killed, including the pilot. Witnesses say the tail appeared to come off the helicopter. Chopper crashed in a field near a highway surrounded by businesses. No one on the ground was injured. History will soon be made on the diamond. Alexis Scrappy Hopkins was selected with the eighth pick by the Kentucky Wild Health Genomes, a first year baseball franchise in the Atlantic League. She's expected to be the bullpen catcher and is believed to be the first woman ever drafted by an American professional baseball team for an on-field role. Now to the war in Ukraine. Russia is redefining its war plan as Ukrainian forces continue to stand their ground. ABC's James Longman has the latest. Tonight, Russia now signaling a major change in Ukraine after facing significant setbacks, now appearing to be reframing its mission. The Russian Defense Ministry seeming to significantly scale back its objectives, saying the main goal of the invasion now is to take control of the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. The Pentagon tonight saying Ukrainians have put Russian forces on the defensive around the capital. And for the first time, the U.S. says the Russians no longer have full control of Kherson, a city they had taken over. The Ukrainians now launching counterattacks nearby. A senior U.S. defense official saying Russia may have lost up to 15% of its combat firepower and is now bringing reinforcements in from a Russian-occupied region of Georgia. U.S. intelligence believes as many as 10,000 Russian troops may have been killed so far. But while Russia says it's refocusing its occupation on the Donbass region, this Mariupol official challenging what the Russians are now saying. He says he doesn't believe them. It's a lie. They want much more. They want more than Donbass. They want more than Ukraine. It's absolutely a lie what they say. His city now may be the site of the biggest single loss of life in this war so far. For the first time in videos circulating online, we're seeing the harrowing aftermath of Russia's strike on the theater in Mariupol, where as many as 1,500 people were seeking shelter. Satellite images showing the word children written in Russian, clearly seen in the front and back of the building, the message ignored. Just outside the capital, we're seeing the scope of destruction in Airpin. This verified drone video published by local media showing street after street in flames after relentless shelling. And graphic video circulating online of the Russian airstrike in Kharkiv, where people were lined up for humanitarian aid and food. It killed at least six. In southern Ukraine, residents on the front line of the Russian occupation say there have been more rocket attacks in recent days. While some have vowed to stay, others, like 70-year-old Victor, have had no choice but to flee Russia's onslaught. We barely escaped, he says. Our thanks to James for that report. Before arriving in Warsaw, President Biden visited with U.S. service members at a military base in Poland, which is just 60 miles from the Ukrainian border. He will meet with refugees tomorrow at the border. ABC's chief White House correspondent Cecilia Vega is traveling with the president. Tonight, as NATO allies prepare to move more troops and weapons into Eastern Europe, President Biden in Poland with members of the 82nd Airborne, more than 10,000 U.S. troops in Poland right now, the president thanking them for their service. What's at stake, not just in what we're doing here in Ukraine to try to help the Ukrainian people and keep the massacre from continuing. But beyond that, what's at stake is what's, what, what's, what are your kids and grandkids going to look like in terms of their, their, their freedom? President Biden standing firm in his promise not to send troops into this war. And standing alongside Poland's leader, he said the true show of strength is the unity of the NATO alliance against Vladimir Putin. The single most important thing that uh, we can do from the outset is keep the democracies united in our opposition and our effort to curtail the devastation that is occurring at the hands of a man who, I quite frankly, think is a war criminal. 
Cecilia Vega with the president. And tomorrow, President Biden will witness the humanitarian emergency, the crisis playing out there in Poland for himself. Some of the most innocent victims in this tragedy, orphans who were already facing difficult circumstances, continue to capture our hearts. David Muir in Poland tonight. It's been one month and one day since this war began in Ukraine, leading to the other emergency here, the humanitarian crisis. Tonight, more than 10 million Ukrainians are now displaced from their homes. Our trips here to report on the families fleeing their country. The boy crying after the long journey to get out of Ukraine, telling his mother he is tired. This is yours? So many children carrying their favorite stuffed animals, Alexei, and his favorite dog. Yes, I do. Yes, yes I do. Yes, you do. You have your dog. 22 hours on two trains, sleeping on the floor. Our children sleep in the floor. In the floor. 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 Of the train? Yes. yes. And the family from Kharkiv, the daughter on the missiles landing in their neighborhood. They're okay, just. It's terrifying. And you tried to stay as long as you could? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> My father is still in Ukraine because he can't be with his country. A kiss from her mother. So many of the men, the fathers, the brothers, staying behind to fight the Russians. We saw the room set aside for mothers and children. And tonight, that number. UNICEF now says 4.3 million children have now been displaced because of war. More than half of all the children in Ukraine. And we wondered about the children traveling alone, the orphans of Ukraine, already without parents before the war began. Who is now taking care of them? Tonight, we document their journey. Fleeing the capital of Kyiv, the stops at shelters along the way, in sleeping bags on the floor. City workers from Kyiv are now their caregivers. These are the children who already faced loss even before the war. The boy in blue, the little girl and her smile, showing their strength, their resilience. 40 children from five orphanages in Kyiv. Ola in pink, she is six. And now, like the rest of the children, living in Poland. She tells us of the packed train. She also tells us she wants to go home, that Putin should leave. There are also the teenagers here without parents. They already survived their own heartbreak. Now they care for the younger children. 17-year-old Maxim with two of the children on his lap. When Putin's war began, he was terrified. Uh, around a long time, um, um, I afraid, uh, very afraid, uh, I worry. I was worried. 17-year-old Alexander tells us just being here in Poland has brought him some peace. It's not in danger uh, in uh, Poland. But, uh, I dream in the moment uh, about uh, stopped uh, war and uh, we come back, well, no, back uh, in Ukraine. We are allowed into the facility in Ustron, now taking care of the children. Two little girls, Nastia and Augusta, yeah. both eight, their beds next to each other. Nastia telling us about the bombs that used to fall where she lived. Augusta telling us about the harrowing journey, being told to close the windows and turn off their lights on the train because they saw explosions so close to them. I was scared, she told us. I didn't know if I would survive. These boys, Danya and Kola, are both nine, telling us about the tanks they saw and the security checkpoints they had to pass through, the kind of images children will carry their entire lives. Kola says he would like Putin gone and for Russia and Ukraine to be friends. Here in Poland alone, more than two million Ukrainian refugees now. The children here have been tested, and so have the workers. Catherine Komar, just one of the many who are now caring for the children, hoping to do right by them. The children talk about the sirens. Yes, yes. And that and, uh, there are no more sirens here yes. in Poland. It's uh, calm and quiet, and it's the most important is that the place is safe. And, and that's what you're doing for them? Yes. I can tell it's been hard for you. Actually, it is, <laughs> but we are trying to be strong. We were there as a new day begins for the orphans in Poland. They put on their new backpacks 
having survived without parents, now surviving a war. It is their first day of school here. Their arms around each other. They are each other's family. About to walk into their classrooms for a new chapter. And for the young mothers we have met here in Poland, another day too. Without their husbands and brothers, there was Oksana and baby Alexander now living on that stage in a Ukrainian theater. And the toy given to Alexander from a devoted volunteer along their escape route. Thank you. Thank you. We hope you go home soon. David Muir in Poland tonight. Earlier this week, our Lindsay Davis interviewed a remarkable Chicago ER doctor who wrote a book about being on the front lines of two immense challenges and how he pushed forward. Here's their conversation. Now turning to the city of Chicago and how one inner city hospital has weathered multiple crises in the last two years, rising rates of crime and gun violence coupled with the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Thomas Fisher is an emergency medicine physician at the University of Chicago who has served the city's south side for more than 20 years. He's the author of the new book, The Emergency, A Year of Healing and Heartbreak in a Chicago ER. Dr. Fisher, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. I couldn't be happier to be here. Thanks for having me on. So you begin your book in March of 2020, the very start of the COVID-19 pandemic. Your emergency room was already full, treating victims of the city's gun violence epidemic. You write that it was as if you and your colleagues had to relearn medicine. It just relive for us those, those first few days and weeks. Those were such frightening times. If you remember, all of a sudden in March, society closed. Everything from the NBA shutting down to our stores, limiting access, um, everything we had to do was new and different. And that was no different in the emergency department. Our waiting rooms, previously filled with the chronically ill, we left and all we saw were people who had high fevers, coughs. We had to don and doff protective wear in a way that we had only practiced but hadn't had to actually do in real life. And for the first time, our own lives were in the equation when we went to work. And, and this pandemic, of course, as you just stated, has extended now more than two years. You and your staff have had to see the worst of it uh, during that time. What keeps you, you going as well as your staff? Um, if nothing else, this has refocused us on the recognition that we're all in this together. Um, our health has come into sharp relief. It's become clear that our bodies are the biological platform on, upon which everything else that we do exists. Our ability to work and love and learn and interact with one another is all dependent on our health. And while that was conceptual before the pandemic, there's nothing like the idea that almost a million people are now dead as a function of COVID over the past two years to refocus us on the importance, the central importance of our health and our healthcare system in shaping our lives. And when your hospital is busiest, you write that, that you can get to about 10 patients an hour with face-to-face -face time only lasting for about three minutes per person, a, a very short amount of time. It, what suffers most when you only get a, a short glimpse of your patient's condition? Well, fortunately, those settings are rare. Um, only in the busiest of times, in the busiest of areas, do you have that limited time frame where you get to know somebody. Um, what's interesting about taking care of patients in the emergency department is there's such intimacy between strangers. It is in those moments that people come in seeking help for something that is most tender and dear to them, their, their bodies and their health. And they reveal to you things that are extremely private and intimate. And sometimes they reveal their bodies themselves. And throughout the book, you write letters to specific patients that you've treated, writing to one patient, I want you to see me just as I want to see you. We're here together. What is the message that you're trying to convey to your former patients and, and your readers in the letters? Throughout the book, what I try to do is bring people into the intimacy of that physician-patient relationship and to see how both physicians and patients are trapped in an unjust system. As society is shaped by racial caste and decisions that elevate profit over people, so is the healthcare system. And so is that shaped in our interaction, which often limits the time that we have or the ability to solve their true problems. 
And, and you also include that black people in Chicago make up 29 percent of the population, but made up 72 percent of the deaths during COVID. There are, there are of course, a, a number of factors at play, poverty, violence, inequality, and, and few easy solutions. But there are some concrete steps that you think would make a difference in the community that you serve. Like what? Well, first of all, I'm not naive enough to think that we're going to transform society based on my book. But I do think that if we take a step back and are honest about the trades that we're making and are honest about the importance of our health and the contributions that we together can make to improvement, we can rest our social justice platform entirely on the recognition that if we measure our health and measure progress in the health of our population, we'll recognize when we've made a difference. Dr. Fisher, once again, we thank you so much for joining us. The Emergency, a Year of Healing and Heartbreak in a Chicago ER is available today, and you can find it wherever books are sold. Lindsay, thank you. Yes, thank you, Lindsay. And still to come, the attack on a Saudi oil depot that has put a major event in the kingdom at risk. And did you see the costume designs in the movie Dune? We're going to hear from the woman behind those out-of-this-world looks next. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. It's finally here, Hollywood's biggest, most spectacular night, and... We're so excited to be on the red carpet at the Oscars, and we can't wait to see you there. We are streaming live to you from the red carpet. On the red carpet live, count down to the Oscars. The stars, the glamour, the style. This is where it's all happening. We will see you on the red carpet at the Oscars. On the red carpet live, count down to the Oscars. Watch it all, streaming on ABC News Live. After a month of fighting, the president heads to the front lines and new warnings about Putin's next move. Now, Sunday, breaking new details from the war zone, plus the contentious Supreme Court hearings. Will Judge Jackson get confirmed? Sunday on ABC's This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. A raging wildfire erupted at an oil depot in Saudi Arabia after Houthi rebels launched a series of attacks there. The blast comes just days before Saudi Arabian Grand Prix is set to take place. According to The Guardian, the attack has now put that race at risk. Attacks come as Saudi Arabia still leads a coalition battling the Iran-backed Houthis who seized Yemen's capital in September of 2014. Wearing a black leather jacket and aviator shades, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un supervised the launch of a new intercontinental ballistic missile, footage on state media shows. North Korea's latest launch was a test that leader Kim Jong-un said was designed to demonstrate the might of its nuclear force and deter any U.S. military moves. With a range that the Japanese government says probably exceeds 9,000 miles, the missile could strike targets anywhere in the world virtually except a few countries in South America and parts of Antarctica. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge arrived to the Bahamas last night where they were greeted by a traditional parade and then they had a school visit. Schools on the island were closed for nearly two years as a result of COVID-19 and the Royals took part in a video conference to see how the students were coping following the reopening. Despite the warm welcome, their Caribbean tour has been marked by protests over the British Empire's legacy. 
including slavery. Next to the series Women Behind the Lens, tonight the spotlight is on the woman who was the creative force behind the out-of-this-world costume designs in the movie Dune. The film is up for 10 Oscars, and we caught up with Jacqueline West about how she turned to the past for her futuristic looks. Jacqueline, this is your fourth Oscar nomination. Is there anything particularly special about this one? This is the first time I've ever done a sci-fi film, so yes. And the first time Denis asked me, I said, but I don't do sci-fi. And he said, that's why I want you, Jacqueline. And I thought, why not? You know, this is a category that is dominated by women by and large. Tell me about the significance of that, because it has to feel pretty special that no matter who wins, it's probably going to be a woman that gets up on that stage. It's kind of a woman's feel, but when you think of great fashion designers, you know, Balenciaga, Dior, that was a world dominated primarily by men. And that women have carved such a, a place in the industry. You know, I think we all have Edith Head and Deborah Nadulman who headed our union for so many years and championed us, got us front card credits. And she really pushed all of her women friends to really exert themselves in the industry. There really has been a huge effort with regards to the gender equity pay gap in Hollywood. How do you feel about where things are? Has there been a significant amount of progress made or is there still a lot of work left to be done in this? I think there's a lot of work left to be done. There is an unfairness. The more people speak out and talk about it and make it known, the more credence it will get. What will be the biggest signal for you that progression has happened? I think when people stop commenting on it and making us aware, we all get so caught up in our own careers that we forget that there's young people coming up that we have to watch over and protect their future and make something equitable because it is really really hard work it's not just nine to five and we love the fashion and flair of the oscars but the real reason for the awards of course the films and those talented people behind them abc's kana whitworth is on the red carpet for us in hollywood tonight for a look at the favorites to win and the possible surprises Hey, Phil, so we are getting ready here. Actually, right behind us, they're actually drilling in the lights uh, under where it says Oscars right there. Let me introduce Clayton Davis. He is the senior awards editor at Variety. You're sort of here to walk us through what we can anticipate on the big day. Let's start with best picture. A lot of people had the power of the dog locked in, but Coda is making this really late surge. Do you think it can last? I think it is going to last. Yeah. I think it's going to make some history. First streamer is going to win best picture on wow. Sunday. It's going to be Apple, and who would have thunk it would have been Apple? Yeah, I mean, Netflix has been trying so hard. For so long, and 12 nominations for Power of the Dog. And listen, Power of the Dog could still win it. Belfast could still win it. But Coda is that feel-good movie. We just had a really rough two years. Oscar voters were looking for a good mood. You can't do worse than Coda. And to your point there, it only has three other nominations, right? So I actually think there's history in that, right? Yes. It'll be the first film since 1935 with so few nominations. Yeah, Grand Hotel was the movie that won Best Picture and Best Picture only, and it's the wow. only thing it was nominated for. But it will be the first film uh, since director and editor have existed together and not have nominations in those categories. No wow. film has won Best Picture without that. There's like all the stats are going to fall on Sunday, but Power of the Dog could still do it. And to that point, the director, she might walk away with the Oscar here. Jane Campion, the first woman to ever be nominated twice, right? Yes, for first an Oscar. woman to be nominated twice. Uh, second woman ever nominated for Best Director. Right. Uh, and a tour, people love her, respect her. What she brings to Power of the Dog is remarkable. Uh, right now, it looks like that she would be the only representation for Power of the Dog because it could win director only. It would be the first wow. time since Mike, Mike Nichols in 1967 to just win director only. So it might pick up other things, but if it wins picture, director, and screenplay, she's nominated all three of those categories, ninth person in history to win those three categories. Okay, so you can't count out Power of the Dog no. anywhere is what you're saying. No. Let's talk about best actor now. Does Will Smith just have this thing locked up? I never like to say locked because Oscars have failed me before, 
but he's won all the televised award shows. Coincidentally, only one person has lost Best Actor after losing all those televised award shows. 20 years ago this year, Denzel Washington beat Russell Crowe for A Beautiful Mind. Oh, my. It was also the first year that Will Smith was nominated. And, of course, he's also nominated, nominated this, this year. year. It's quite a cast of nominees, but also Will Smith has been nominated, what, two times before yeah. and never won? And some people feel like he deserves this Oscar sort of as a culmination of his career because while they love the movie, they think maybe this wasn't his actual best performance ever. I think it's I think it's one of his best. Sure. And listen, it's very rare that a person wins an Oscar for their very best, and it's always subjective. However, it, it's a great performance, third time's a charm for him. People want to see him win. He's part of that 90s movie star that hasn't won an Oscar yet. So I think everyone's rooting for him. I think a lot of people are going to tune in just to see Will on the stage. Absolutely, a lot of support there. And so for Best Actress in a Leading Role, I mean, for me personally, Jessica Chastain was just incredible in the eyes of Tammy Faye. What about you? She's a favorite in the category because she won SAG and Critics' Choice, great right. barometers for Oscar. But in reality, any five of them can win. Sure. Right now, I'm predicting Penelope Cruz oh. to make some history, a lot of support for her. She gets a lot of that international block voting for her. It'll be her second Oscar win, and she'll be the first person to win in this modern era without getting nominated at any of the televised award ceremonies. So if stats wow. are falling in picture, why not actress while we're at it? Okay, I love it. And, and in your opinion, what do you think is the best surprise that we might see on Sunday? We might see Lin-Manuel Miranda become an EGOT. I mean... I think we're going to see it. <laughs> I think he'll be the fastest person to EGOT really? in history. Yeah, he'll be the third youngest, fastest to EGOT. I mean, listen, Encanto is everywhere. Sure. He also might give us the first uh, woman of color to win uh, for original score, Jermaine yeah. Franco. Uh, other things, Dune, I think, is going to lead the tally. It, it will win anywhere between five and eight Oscars. Okay, So wow. just keep your eye on Dune. I think Dune will lead the night. All right, well, thank you so much for your insight. Thank we you. so appreciate you. And, being here. And, Phil, we're all curious as to know what your thought is on Best Picture. Oh, Kena, I never get it right, so <laughs> I don't want to publicly jinx anybody. Kena Wentworth, thank you so much. And ABC News Live has you covered leading up to the Oscars. Stream with us on Sunday starting at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. 10.30 a.m. Pacific. And still to come, are you like so many and have not watched many or even any of the movies nominated for this year's Best Picture? Our Will Gans has the details on where you can stream them all. Stay with us. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 7 there for you with one touch the abc news app download it now this morning the oscars party wars on with a special gma Woo! let's go oscar baby the stars the style the winners and some hollywood surprises you won't see coming this morning it's gma's oscars after party after a month of fighting the president heads to the front lines now sunday breaking new details from the war zone and will judge jackson get confirmed sunday on abc's this week america's number one news abc news most watched most trusted and streaming live to you anytime anywhere and free this is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Welcome back. If you're looking for some fun this weekend, there are plenty of Oscar nominees to screen, but where do you find them? Fortunately, our Will Gans breaks it down for us. It's Oscar weekend and the stage is set. And if you're really behind on watching this year's big films, there's a 100% chance that we're all going to die. No need to panic. Coda is the heartwarming story of a high schooler with deaf parents and a deaf brother who falls in love with music. All that I need to get by. 
Gold Derby currently has Coda as the favorite for Best Picture, and you can stream it now on Apple TV+. The biggest competition for Coda and the most nominated film this year is The Power of the Dog. I wonder what little lady made these. I did, sir. This Western is a dark, slow burn. It's streaming now on Netflix. Belfast is the story of a family in Northern Ireland during the Troubles in 1969, loosely based on writer-director Kenneth Branagh's own childhood. <laughs> Belfast is available on Amazon Prime Video and Apple TV+. Also up for best picture, King Richard. I think you might just have the next Michael Jordan. Oh, no, brother man. I got me the next, too. Will Smith has all but locked up the best actor race. You can rent King Richard on Amazon, Apple, or HBO Max. The race for Best Actress is a little bit tighter. Jessica Chastain is nominated for playing Tammy Faye Baker. This is who I am. You can watch The Eyes of Tammy Faye on Amazon Prime Video or Apple TV. Or if you simply want to dance your way into Oscar Sunday, West Side Story is up for Best Picture, and that is streaming now on Disney+. Plus. Our thanks to Will for that. That's our show for tonight. A programming note for you with the Ukraine war now entering its second month. Our Lindsay Davis will be live in Poland next week detailing what's next for the millions displaced and what's ahead in this horrific conflict. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7", is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Tonight, a special edition of World News Tonight and breaking news what Russia is now saying tonight, signaling potentially a major shift in the war in Ukraine and President Biden here in Poland with U.S. troops. Tonight, a Russian military general now saying the, quote, main goal of the invasion is the liberation of eastern Ukraine, the Donbass region. This comes after Russian troops have been pushed back by the Ukrainians outside the capital of Kyiv. Despite a new attack on an oil depot near Kyiv, Russia now claiming it has no intention of seizing the city. Tonight, what the Pentagon now believes involving the capital. And the other development after Russia seized the city of Kherson reports tonight the Russians no longer have full control of that city. And tonight here, harrowing video emerging online from inside the Mariupol theater, where hundreds were seeking shelter when it was targeted by a Russian airstrike. Tonight, Ukraine now saying at least 300 people were killed in that theater. James Longman in Lviv, Ukraine tonight, and Martha Raditz with me here in Warsaw. What she's learned from her sources tonight, what the U.S. believes is driving this new message from Russia tonight. President Biden here in Poland this evening with U.S. troops, members of the 82nd Airborne, Cecilia Vega traveling with the president. The humanitarian emergency worsening here tonight. 10 million Ukrainians now displaced by war. More than 2 million of them right here in Poland. And tonight here, the orphans of Ukraine, without a parent even before the war began. 
their journey, who's caring for them now, and their powerful message tonight for the world. Back in the U.S. tonight, growing scrutiny involving Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas after news his wife was texting the Trump White House after the election, pushing for efforts to overturn Joe Biden's victory and new questions after Justice Thomas was the only justice who voted against releasing White House records related to the January 6th attack. John Carl standing by tonight. The deadly accident at an amusement park in Florida. A 14-year-old boy who fell from a ride. Authorities say he slipped out of his seat. And the major weather system moving in for the east tonight. Wind chills dropping into the teens and single digits. Rob Marciano standing by to time this out tonight. From ABC News, this is a special edition of World News Tonight with David Muir. Reporting tonight from Warsaw, Poland. And good evening on this Friday night from Warsaw, Poland. President Biden is here tonight, part of his high-stakes mission in Europe to rally America's allies to confront Russia's war in Ukraine. And tonight, meeting with U.S. troops, the 82nd Airborne. But we begin tonight with the breaking headline, Russia tonight signaling what could be a major shift in the war, a narrowing of its objectives after suffering setbacks, particularly outside the capital of Kyiv. Tonight, Russia now saying their main goal all along has been only to take control of the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. Tonight here, what the Pentagon believes is driving this. Now, all of this playing out after Russia claims to have bombed a major fuel depot with cruise missiles fired from the sea, claiming that depot outside the capital was supplying Ukrainian forces. And in another major development tonight, a senior U.S. defense official now says Russian forces that had taken control of the city of Kherson are no longer in full control of that city. Tonight, civilians repeatedly targeted in Kharkiv, an attack on people lining up for humanitarian aid and food, killing at least six. And these searing new images tonight from the devastated city of Mariupol. After Russia's relentless attacks, tens of thousands still trapped in that city with little food, water, or power. And the images just now emerging online tonight from the moments after the missile strike of that theater in Mariupol. Officials now say at least 300 people who were seeking shelter there were killed. We do have it all covered tonight, beginning with this new message from Russia, what they now claim their military goal has been all along. Martha Raddatz with her sources. Can the Russians be believed on this? And ABC's James Longman leading us off from inside Ukraine tonight. Tonight, Russia now signaling a major change in Ukraine after facing significant setbacks, now appearing to be reframing its mission. The Russian Defense Ministry seeming to significantly scale back its objectives, saying the main goal of the invasion now is to take control of the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. The Pentagon tonight saying Ukrainians have put Russian forces on the defensive around the capital. And for the first time, the U.S. says the Russians no longer have full control of Kherson, a city they had taken over. The Ukrainians now launching counterattacks nearby. A senior U.S. defense official saying Russia may have lost up to 15% of its combat firepower and is now bringing reinforcements in from a Russian-occupied region of Georgia. U.S. intelligence believes as many as 10,000 Russian troops may have been killed so far. And while Russia says it's refocusing its occupation on the Donbass region, this Mariupol official challenging what the Russians are now saying. He says he doesn't believe them. It's a lie. They want much more. They want more than Donbass. They want more than Ukraine. It's absolutely lie what they say. His city now may be the site of the biggest single loss of life in this war so far. For the first time in videos circulating online, we're seeing the harrowing aftermath of Russia's strike on the theater in Mariupol, where as many as 1,500 people were seeking shelter. Satellite images showing the word children written in Russian, clearly seen in the front and back of the building, the message ignored. Just outside the capital, we're seeing the scope of destruction in Airpin. This verified drone video published by local media showing street after street in flames after relentless shelling. And graphic video circulating online of the Russian airstrike in Kharkiv, where people were lined up for humanitarian aid and food. It killed at least six. In southern Ukraine, residents on the front line of the Russian occupation say there have been more rocket attacks in recent days. While some have vowed to stay, others, like 70-year-old Victor, have had no choice but to flee Russia's onslaught. We barely escaped, he says. And James Longman joins us from Lviv again tonight. And James, if the Russians are to be believed, and obviously that's a big if, when they say they're going to focus on the eastern part of Ukraine, there are still major questions, of course, about how much of the region they plan to take, because the Ukrainians have signaled already 
that they will fight for all of it. Well, that's right, David. Two-thirds of that region is contested. So does Russia now pour all its energy into taking the entire area? And Mariupol, all signs point to Russia permanently occupying that city. Ukraine has been well-armed and resourced by the West, and they have no intention of backing down now. David. All right, James Longman leading us off on a Friday night. James, thank you. Tonight, the Biden administration, the Pentagon, of course, following this new messaging from Russia very closely. I want to bring in our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz, with me here in Warsaw. And, and Martha, I know you've been talking with your sources tonight. I'm so curious what they think here. Did the, the Russians underestimate the Ukrainians? Did they underestimate how hard it would be to push in on the capital? That, that's exactly what they do. And, and that's exactly what they're doing now. They're moving those troops. They're moving them to defensive positions. They've been